Brexit means Brexit, and we're going to make a success of it. It was a national vote, it was a national referendum, and Parliament has to respect that. The working class have spoke, and I'm one of them, and I'm with them. I think the people in this country have had enough of experts. The time when people trust politicians, that's over. This is painful, and it will be for a long time. Can you give us a question? I'm can you, not going to give you a can question. You can you stay categorical? You are fake news. Sir. This is a Westminster bubble thing. What? Hello and welcome to Politics at the Edge, the Eastminster podcast from the University of East Anglia. And today we're going to talk about one of the most divisive figures in the world today. A man whose supporters love him no matter what he does and whose critics are at times bemused but also appalled by his behaviour. Who could I possibly be talking about, Alan? Wenger. <laughs> no, no? Yeah. no. It's not football? No, it's not football. No, uh... it's got to be... Donald Trump. Donald Trump, the 45th President of the United States. And I'm really pleased because we've got some great guests in to talk about this. Dr. Emma Long, Senior Lecturer in American Studies. Hello, good morning. Hi, good morning. And Dr. Michael Fraser, Lecturer in Political and Social Theory. Good morning. Hello. So um, I thought it was a good time to talk about Trump because we've just had the state visit in the UK. And next year, we've got another presidential election. So it's a good time to think about Trump and what impact he's having at home and what impact he's having over here and in the rest of the world. Um, And I thought the state visit was really um, interesting, and really entertaining in a way, because it was funny that before he even landed, um, he kicked off a row between himself and, and Sadiq Khan about what a terrible mayor he is. You could kind of see that as soon as plane Air Force One came into British airspace, those tweets started happening. Um, So let's hear a little bit. Let's kick off straight away with a bit of Sadiq Khan and his criticisms of that state visit. My concerns have been the state banquet, all it entails, and the rolling out the carpet. Why? Because it condones some of the things he's said and done. And it gives sucker, by the way, uh, to the global far-right movement. I think there are many, many racists who think he's their poster boy. There are many, many racists around the world who are on the fringes. You go to Hungary, you go to Italy, you go to France, you go in our own country... These were groups whose views were on the margins and on the fringes. They've been normalised and mainstreams because of Donald Trump. So Sadiq Khan there criticised as well for comparing Trump in his rallies to the fascists of the 20th century. Does he make a fair point, Alan? Well, he's making a political point, right? One of the features of UK politics is the way in which we sometimes look to America to judge where we are or to see what Americans are doing as something that might happen here. And then we play out our own political disputes via the figure of the American president. But, of course, he's also making a point about the global shifts that are going on in politics. He mentions other European countries where there are leaders to the right coming up, and clearly there's a discussion going on in this country at the moment as to what kind of leaders we want. And looking to Trump is a kind of way of looking at a potential precedent that some think is good and some think is not. Michael, what do you think? Well, it's... Rhetoric that you see echoed uh, by political figures in the United States. Um, Joe Biden, in his launch video, focused exclusively on uh, what happened in Charlottesville, the neo-Nazi rally in Charlottesville where uh, violence occurred and there was a death of an anti Uh, anti-fascist protester and how Trump said that there were good people on both sides uh, during during these events. And uh, a lot of uh, what Biden's case is, unlike people further to his left, like uh, Bernie Sanders or uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who want to do something quite different from whatever has been done before. Biden's basic case is uh, is for a return to the status quo ante, that there's something new and frightening uh, happening, not just in the United States, but around the world. And Emma, you've just been to America, haven't you? This has seemed very differently over there? To an extent. I mean, there was very little coverage of these tweets against uh, anti Sadiq Khan, both this one and some of the others that have came out before and since. So on one hand, you can argue he's making a domestic political point, particularly in the context of other comments he's made about Muslims in the American context, uh, the way he's used the UK and and issues about violence in the, the capital to make points in the United States about violence, but also comparing knife crime and, and gun crime in the United States. So there, there is a sort of speaking to the base issue that his, his own Republican base, those kind of slightly further right, sort of the more extreme conservative wing that uh, Michael's talking about here. Um, but at the same time, you can only find that information if you're listening out for it. So he's speaking to people who are already 
listening out for those kinds of messages. And if you are not part of that that group, you have to dig reasonably hard in the American media to find coverage of it. So he gets the advantage of speaking to his base while not necessarily riling up those who, who disagree with him, at least on this issue. There are other issues where that's not so much the But he, case. he also seems to be intervening into British politics, right? In that a lot of these were covered by the British media, which I guess he knew they would be. Uh, and there are people in this country who would welcome him saying these things, who, who, who buy into his kind of critique of Khan and think that London is turned into this kind of chaotic thing from a Scorsese movie in the 70s or something. I mean, is that, is that unprecedented at all uh, for, for a US president to kind of so intervene? I remember when Obama made some comments about Brexit, quite a few people were, that's wrong, he shouldn't be interfering in our politics. But here's Trump turning up and directly intervening into Londoners' political lives. Yeah, and I, I think... The Obama comparison is a, an interesting one because there was a huge amount of criticism for Obama commenting on the, the Brexit vote. Um, and other presidents have tended to be far more circumspect on these kinds of, of issues. I mean, even thinking about uh, the close working relationship between Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher during that kind of the late Cold War era when they're, they're working together on, on those issues, they're very careful to sort of stay out of each other's uh, remit on, on those. So I think it is something that's relatively new, but maybe re reflective of the narrative of, of globalization that can, what's happening in one country do, does have a big impact elsewhere and maybe the, the narrative shifting right. slightly. But I, I don't think Trump's goal is actually to affect, uh, you know, municipal politics in London. I, I think Sadiq Khan is speaking to one audience, and certainly, you know, the London electorate, if not the British electorate more generally, is is eating up any any criticism of Trump. I think what Trump is talking to are Americans who may not know who the mayor of London is, indeed they probably don't, but who hear the name Sadiq Khan, and there's been uh, a role that in in the American right wing media that. Uh, Europe in, in general, and, and often Britain in particular, plays, that these are places that have already fallen to the Muslim invasion. Yeah, he's right? a Muslim mayor, and that's a problem. Right, and, 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 and there's talk on Fox News of areas of London or, or Birmingham that are no-go zones. And so, you know, whenever Trump has an opportunity to uh, demonize someone Muslim, that will play well at home among his base, even if Americans know nothing whatsoever and couldn't care less about the actual political issues in which this Muslim politician is in embedded. All right, really interesting. Thank you. Well, one other controversy that uh, we've been noticing uh, during that visit was a, a post-Brexit trade deal and what that might entail. And at the press conference, which Trump held with Theresa May, he was asked um, if American companies providing services to the NHS might form part of any trade deal. So let's have a listen about uh, uh, what he had to say. Look, I think everything with the trade deal is on the table. When you... When you're dealing in trade, everything's on the table. So NHS or anything else, or a lot, a lot more than that. But everything will be on the table, absolutely. Okay. But the point about making trade deals is, of course, that both sides negotiate and come to uh, an agreement about what should or should not be in that trade deal. Theresa May there frantically backpedalling. Um, and it was interesting. I thought that he said that in the press conference. And then later on, a few hours later, he went into an interview with Piers Morgan, who's a clear supporter of his. And then he said, no, actually, the NHS wouldn't be on the table. Why does that happen? Is it because he doesn't know what he's talking about? Yes. Just he, as simple as that. I, that. It was so obvious to me that he didn't know what the NHS was when he gave that answer. When you're listening to him, there is no mention of health. Aside from not knowing the intricacies of the, of the British medical system, I think he didn't know what the letters NHS stood for. <laughs> so th there's no reason to take what he says in those sort of situations as an indication of the policy of the administration. Although after he says those things, then the administration has to deal with it somehow, right? And they might change their policy as a result of what he says. Of an off-the-cuff comment, yeah. 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 And this is classic Trump. I mean, you know, you look back at any number of these press conferences that he's had both abroad and, and at home, um, this kind of general, the, the unwillingness in a way initially to narrow anything down 
to, to be specific. I mean, this is one of the criticisms that has often been leveled at him, right? That he doesn't speak specific, he doesn't talk in these press conferences about specifics. It's all about the kind of the generalities and the, almost like the rallying yeah. type. Everything's yeah. going to be great. It's going to yeah. be so amazing. And then yeah. what happens is he, so he won't, pin anything down either because and I agree in this case he doesn't know the specifics of what he's he's talking about or he simply doesn't want to get into that kind of, of debate and then the administration is forced to backtrack or become more specific and then you get into all the the debate about fake news and misrepresentation and the liberal agenda so I mean it it speaks to other things that are going on in but in just the a slightly administration. differ from that I mean I get the impression sometimes he says whatever the last person he was speaking to had told him mm. or what he saw on Fox News last night. So it may be that it has been discussed more broadly in, in the White House or in other, other circles how they feel about potential trade deals and the fact that they might be looking to have everything on the table. And it is the case that there are leading Brexit advocates in this country are very open to um, liberalising healthcare markets in the UK. Daniel Hannan prominent Brexit MEP authored a report with the Cato Institute in the US, which is a very free market institution, which is very clear about how uh, they wanted to see health services on the table. Now, there's some debate about what exactly that means. It might mean insurance provision. It might mean services that are currently provided already by private providers, but it might also potentially mean owning trust hospitals and so forth. So I think there is there is reason to think that part of some people's agenda in relation to Brexit is a very liberal trade deal with the US that does mean that some of the things that they see as being restrictive anti-competitive practices like health services, education services, are made available to profit-seeking yeah. organisations based in the US. It's hard for British people to, to really understand the extent to which the healthcare industry in the United States is an industry and indeed one of our largest industries. And there, there's no real chance, and, and this is why Obamacare was designed the way it was, of just nationalizing that industry uh, because they're too powerful. So even if in that moment Trump had no idea what he was talking about, the power of American insurance companies, American healthcare providers as for-profit corporations is such that their lobbyists will ensure that their interests are included in any negotiations with the post-Brexit Britain. I thought it was also interesting. He didn't seem to know what he was talking about with regard to the Irish border either, because once he landed in Ireland, he had a press conference with Leo Varadkar, and he sort of said, well, we have a border situation, and you have a border situation, and then Leo Varadkar had to pick him up and go, no, actually, we don't want a wall. You know, you want a wall with Mexico. We don't want a wall. And again, I just thought, does he just not read his briefs? Because someone's writing briefs for him, right? I mean, that's what happens, isn't it? Yeah, well, the, <laughs> yeah. From, from what I've read, he doesn't, I mean, there's a, 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 a longstanding joke, is he illiterate? Uh, I don't think he's literally functionally illiterate, but he clearly dislikes text. Uh, and his briefers have been told to more and more use pictures rather than text. I, I mean, there's a real issue here. Really? Uh, no, this is really? a serious issue of, of, of cognitive decline. Where are you uh, getting this from? Is this inside a This is, pe in, people are saying. Yeah. No, but I, I've, I, I don't, recall the citations. <laughs> so maybe I'm suffering cognitive decline as well. But if you listen to the way he spoke when he was a you know, famous real estate magnate in, the, magnate in the 80s and 90s, he didn't sound quite as simplistic in his word choice, in his sentence structure, in his utter dissociation from, from reality as he does now. And he, he is, I, I, I mean, one reason why Trump doesn't pose as great a threat as he might is because he's clearly elderly and unwell. Uh, and, and it's not at all clear to what extent he, he, he's functioning at a level that you would expect a president of the United States to be functioning. Emma, is he? I mean, he's, he's famously not allowed his doctors pub to publish his reports. Is he elderly and unwell? It's difficult to tell, isn't it? I mean, there, there are certainly anecdotal um, suggestions that that's the case. But actually, even if that isn't the case, even if that's uh, things that we're we're reading into it. It speaks to a larger issue of the question of engagement with the details of what's going on, because a lot of whether it's the Mueller report or the various books that have been published of, of late about the the Trump administration, what the the general story seems to be is of of uh, a president who's doing one thing and an administration that's doing something else and often the administration are having to limit or restrict or backpedal 
um, statements or tweets that the president is is making or in some cases they are actively working against him this is what came out in the Mueller report in, in certain areas that they are actively trying to to work against what he's he's doing to convince him not to do so whether it's a question of, of cognitive impairment and, and illness or age um, or whether it is simply somebody who was not and is not prepared to engage with the the details of uh, and specifics of what this office involves, they raise some very big questions. So about I'm going to stick up for Trump, partly as someone of a certain age beginning to experience cognitive decline. <laughs> um, but actually, that that remark he says, you know, you, we have a border situation in the United States, and you have one here. That that shows a slightly more nuanced and sophisticated understanding of Irish border politics than a large number of British MPs at the moment, who don't <laughs> seem to even be aware that there, that there is, is indeed a border issue at all in Ireland. So you know, strike one for in in, in the pro-Trump column. There, he knows there's at the least two countries on the island of Ireland. I mean, it's a it's a pretty it's a basic bar. level, though, isn't it? You've got a border problem, <laughs> we've got a border problem. When you go on to like the next stage of yeah. that, they're talking about two very different interpretations yes. of the border. Yeah. But we have problem. had, we did have Secretary of State of Northern Ireland express surprise that people in the north of Ireland voted on lines of unionist versus nationalist. And we did have a Conservative MP thinking that English people could get Irish citizenship uh, and all kinds of things. So, quite, so actually, this uh, this... Lack of attention to detail is something that we are finding more broadly. Across yeah, it's, it's not just Trump. I thought one of the other interesting things about the state visit was the role of the royal family. Um, the Queen, in her um, in her address at that state banquet, talked about. Um, the shared sacrifices of the Second World War and how Britain and the United States worked with other allies to build an assembly of international institutions. And she said, we are forever mindful of the original purpose of these structures, nations working together to safeguard a hard-won peace. And I thought that was really interesting because we have what is supposed to be an apolitical monarch saying to Trump, well, do you know what? We should be working together and you shouldn't be so protectionist. Did you think that was interesting? Well, that's obviously a speech written by the government. So that's the government trying to give this message. And, I'm, and I, I, I'm not quite sure how one can read that. Is that them making a message relating to the Brexit context and saying, oh, no, we're still thinking internationally? Uh, or is that actually to do with deeper concerns about Trump's relationship to NATO and military spending and the organisation of European defence more broadly? I think there's something going on there at a deeper level trying to signal some kind of a position. Well, I don't suppose they're signalling that directly to Trump, but I imagine these things are meant to be read and noticed by the advisors in the room. Is that how it works, do you think? I think that's probably the, the case. I mean, it's a very clever speech, given that we know it's written by the government, but it's coming from the monarch yeah. who is, is expected to be apolitical. So it's it's very cleverly making a certain point that's that could be read in a number of different ways without being seen as, as the Queen intervening directly in in politics. But my... Se I mean, my, my reading of it is that it's sort of speaking to issues of the UN and NATO and the criticism that the Trump administration has been offering, particularly of the UK, but other European countries for not paying their, their share of, of NATO uh, expenses, of, of um, perhaps not being as supportive of the US as the Trump administration should think. But that's not to say there isn't that domestic political message being sent. And there was other, there were other interesting reports, weren't there, about Prince Charles's involvement and, and him talking to Trump about climate change, which, which again is, is, I mean, as a monarch, he's not supposed to do that, but he's not the monarch yet. So he has a, a little bit of freedom. Well, he's the so. Prince of Wales. I don't, I don't know if that's considered an interference in Welsh politics. <laughs> <laughs> this really raises interesting questions because 10 years ago, these statements would have still been apolitical. It, it's remarkable that we're living in a moment where the basic idea that nations should work together towards peace, which sounds like, like the most obvious truism you could possibly state, that's now become a politically loaded, debatable claim. And climate change too. Yeah, which again should be seen as... Uh, something that is, is a fact about the world, when everything we once took for granted is falling out from below us and people are questioning the value of international cooperation for peace. People are denying the, 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 the facts of, of, of science. Uh, then in order to remain apolitical, a monarch would have to say less and less and less until the point where everything is politicized and the monarch would just have to remain silent. <laughs>
OK, one other thing I want to talk about is what impact. Um, we'll talk about Trump at home, but also what impact he's had on UK politics. And one of the things I've noticed as a broadcast journalist is this growing hostility um, to journalists who ask difficult questions. This is uh, Beth Rigby from Sky News, and she was talking, um, out, asking a question at the Boris Johnson campaign launch. So let's have a listen to that. Many of your colleagues worry about your character. You brought shame on your party when you described veiled Muslim women as letterboxes and bank robbers. People who have worked closely with you do not think you're fit to be Prime Minister. Well, Beth, I, I'm, 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 I'm delighted that um, many of my former colleagues uh, seem to dissent from, from, from that view. But, but... So for me, it's quite worrying that a lot of political figures on the left and the right, and we've seen this with Corbyn as well, are trying to avoid questions or, um, or, or they're criticising journalists for asking them. Is that something that UK politicians have copied from Trump or was it a trend here anyway? So we were talking about this at the start, weren't we, that a lot of British politicians and British journalists look to American politics a lot more, in fact, than they look to politics in the continent of Europe. And they do or they are influenced by the things that happen there, and they do see the kinds of attacks on journalism or the rise of a certain kind of critique of journalism that's been important to politics in the US, and that does influence how they're thinking about things. But it's also intrinsic, to, or yeah, it's also coming from within the context of UK politics as well. That broader sense on the part of some, on certain parts of the political spectrum, that journalists are all in it for themselves, are all biased towards the liberal establishment position and that you can't trust anything they say. That's been bumbling around in British politics for a long, long time, but it's kind of risen to the surface in the same time as it's risen to the surface in the US and across Europe. And it's a useful card now for politicians to play because whereas you know, a few years ago politicians were very concerned to look good in the media, now having the media attack you can be a plus point for your supporters. You can say, look, you see they're attacking me. That just goes to show how I'm authentic and saying things that they mm. don't want to hear. And, and, of course, Corbyn uses social media, to, for example, to his own benefit. He, you know, he deliberately doesn't go on the Today programme, doesn't do those interviews. Um, I think what was also interesting is how Trump's had an impact on the way we do politics and not just the interactions with the media. Um, I wanted to play you a clip of Nigel Farage um, on Sky News. Um, their political correspondent, Lewis Goodall, followed him to every Brexit party rally in the run up to the EU elections. And they talked about how politics uh, in the UK is changing. In many walks of life, uh, be it business, be it, be it, uh, be it culture, be it political campaigning, America's always a few years ahead of us. And I have spent a fair bit of time in America. I've learned one or two things. Like what? Uh, just that politics needs to be a bit less drab, a bit less dull. It needs to be lively, fun, energy. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to do here. That's what he's trying to do. Um, do you think other parties will have to do the same and make politics more lively? So, so I think there's actually something really important going on when Farage says that. Go on. Okay? And in some respects, he's correct. Yeah? Which is that it is now the case that politics definitively sits on the entertainment spectrum of media output, along with reality TV shows and comedy shows and all kinds of things. I mean, it was always part of, it has been a long time being part of TV culture, but it's now absolutely part of entertainment. And people move in and out of entertainment and broadcast journalism and politics. Mm -hmm. That's what Boris Johnson's done. That's also what Farage has been doing. He's been entertaining a media character um, and all kinds of political figures. So in that respect, Farage is actually correct. He's noticed the way in which the entertainment politics continuum is more advanced in the US, and we can talk about how long that's been going on for, and how you can then use that now as a basis for forming a political platform. Right, and, and you know, the, the basis of, of Trump's uh, career is a combination of reality television, The Apprentice. And I think one um, element of Trump's career that we don't pay enough attention to is his involvement in professional wrestling, um, which is really, I mean, he, he's been deeply involved. Michael, what's his involvement in professional well, he's, wrestling? He's wrestled. Uh, he, he, he was Why a, didn't I know about this? He, it's true, yeah. he, he was a regular, a regular guest on the WWE <laughs> Uh, or F as it was until the World Wildlife Federation made them change their name. Uh, there, there are clips of him in the ring. Uh, and there is and, – and, and I forget exactly the extent to which the McMahons, the family that runs the WWE, was involved in his, his administration. But I believe he's given official appointments to at least one McMahon uh, who he's been personally close with, with Vince McMahon and the McMahon family 
for, for quite some time. So his wrestling buddy's got a job in government. Right. But more importantly, he's turning politics into a form of professional wrestling. Right. So the, the, the genre that the Trump rally most resembles is less what he did on The Apprentice, which is what we all think about, which is him in the boardroom firing people, although he likes doing that. It actually sounds a lot more like the speeches that wrestlers give before a match, right, where they're taunting and they're, they're provoking violence and they're talking about how great they are and how terrible their opponent is, which is, you know, where he was more of an impartial judge on The Apprentice in professional wrestling. That's where he picked up his speech patterns and everything. Emma. American politics has opened the door for this. It's been going on for a long time. And, and part of it, I think, is the, the nature of just the scale of the country. And when you've got, when you're running for president, particularly, and you have to get to people across such a wide expanse. You need something that's going to hook people in, who's going to, that's going to differentiate you from, from other people. So this idea of, of politics, particularly presidential elections, as entertainment, as character-driven, as drawing people in, not necessarily with the detail of your policies, but I like that person or I recognize that person. That's been going on for decades now. So centuries. It's, I well, mean, it, it, it's certainly the, think back to You know, before there was mass Andrew media, Jackson. exactly, yeah. that, that American politics uh, in the Jacksonian era onward, even before there was, you know, broadcast media, would be a raucous thing that you would get drunk and the, the candidates would give out free beer and you would go here, probably not Andrew Jackson himself, since there were a limited number of places he could go, but the local uh, Democratic official would give a rousing speech that was the town's entertainment for the evening. Yeah. And of course, in their different ways, Kennedy and then most importantly, the professional actor Ronald Reagan uh, brought that into the television era. And you can see Trump as moving that from the kind of uh, you know, classic Hollywood entertainment that Ronald Reagan offered to the kind of uh, post-mass media, social media, reality television, wrestling kind of entertainment. So, I mean, that's the important thing because you're, you're right, politics has always had that element of show and entertainment. It's true in the UK as well. But you know, in, in, in the kind of Jacksonian era, there are performances that are, how can I put it, kind of internal to the world of politics still. They're still kind of political performances Whereas I think what's happening now is that they are absolutely linked in to these television genres. So now you don't look for a character from the world of politics that I'll perform and play and get elected. You look to a character from film or reality TV or television right. entertainment and you play that one and that's the one that people then recognise. Which, which is why there was this, this dream or hope, I think she's dashed it at this point, that the only person who can beat Trump for the Democrats is Oprah. Uh, because, you know, we don't need another politician. And I wouldn't be surprised if uh, one of the more outsidery, uh, less uh, experienced Democratic candidates actually get, ends up getting the nomination. I mean, right now, no one of that celebrity uh, background is, is running. So he does have to face this election next year. Emma, what, what are the issues that he's going to come up against in this election? Oh, wow. Uh, given that you know, a week is a long time in politics and we're talking about next year, any, almost anything could, could happen between then and now. I mean, the, the Democrats, I think, d regardless of who ends up being the, the candidate, are going to, I think, push on issues to, that, that he's talked about but hasn't necessarily delivered on. The wall is one, and while they may not want to make a huge issue of, of that, what they probably do want to make an issue of is the, the gap between what he's saying he's doing and the reality of what he actually is doing. The North Korea situation may also be another one. There was a huge amount of fanfare about Trump's meetings um, with uh, North Korea, but the reality is that nothing practical has, has come of that. Again, not all of which is getting... Uh, reported widely in the the American media, so I suspect they may may one of the things they may well try and do, whether they're successful or not, is another issue. Is is to try and grab that political middle ground. There there are certain voters that are never going to vote Democrat. So what they're looking for is to shore up their own base, but also to to appeal to that group in the middle by saying these are the things that Trump 
promised you and pro- and sounded may have sounded good to you in 2016 but actually look he said all these things but he hasn't actually delivered so now maybe you need to look to to us and are there any supreme court issues coming up that that might be of issue i know this is something that you, that you look into and a lot of the u.s states have started legislating to make abortion more difficult is that gonna is that gonna come up do you think I think it's likely to, um, if only in the election, because if Trump is re-elected, the likelihood of more Supreme Court appointments is is very much there. If you look at the age of Supreme Court justices uh, right now, I mean, he's the two appointments that he's had already um, have have shaped will shape the court for many years to to come. If he has more appointments, then he has the opportunity potentially to shape the court in the same way that Franklin Roosevelt did in the the 1930s, albeit in a lib- Trump would shape it in a conservative direction. Franklin Roosevelt shaped it in a more liberal direction. But there is big concern, and this has been her- around the previous two appointments, that with a more conservative Supreme Court, they'll lean towards um, overturning Roe versus Wade, the 1973 decision, which protects women's right to choose to uh, choose an abortion and we've seen this in a number of of states pushing back harder pushing back where the um the the dates of legality Mm -hmm. are and they make no bones about the fact that this is a challenge to to row they are looking to set up cases that will lead to lawsuits that will get to the supreme court because conservatives think that now they have a court that is sympathetic to overturning Roe, which has been a stalwart of the of I, liberal politics. Can I ask, how does that play out sort of politically and electorally then? Because, I mean, this is, this is only some states are particularly concerned about that. Is that right? In particular parts of the country. Doesn't Trump have those states already? Or He does, but it's making bigger political points to his voters in other, right. other states, um, states that maybe have a, a more balanced population. A lot of these, these laws... Um, certainly at the moment, will not go into effect. The lawmakers know that they're not going to go into mm-hmm. effect. And so they're making political statements as well because they've got to get re-elected at, right. certain, um, at certain points. So it's, it's virtue signalling mm-hmm. um, as much as anything else at the moment uh, because the court has largely stayed away from these kinds of, what about, of issues. Uh, what about people opposed to these changes to or potential changes to Roe versus are, are there sort of people who might support Trump and the Republican Party for a whole variety of reasons, but but this might make them feel, oh no, this is going a bit too far, or is, is there no such constituency? Um, that's a good question. I mean, it's very easy to talk about people support Trump for this reason and yeah. that reason, and, and uh, abortion has been such a hot-button issue in American politics that we tend to forget that there may be other factors that, that yeah. play a, a role here. Uh, it, it's a motivating factor for certain groups. Yeah. Uh, for the, the far left uh, and states like New York, which have passed legislation to protect abortion rights, seeing the possibility that Roe might be overturned. Yeah. And then you've got the other... Um, the other side of this, like Missouri and Arkansas, with these very strict, yeah, yeah. Um, res- very very strict restrictions, um, so you can see that they're yeah. they're having different roles. So it, it may play out in very different but different there's, ways. Uh, there's a real asymmetry here, though, because that left constituency would never support Trump mm-hmm. anyway, whereas the right one, I, I I think one of the most amazing of of Trump's achievements has been holding on to the evangelical Christian vote so strongly. Uh, and there, there are other elements of that, uh, of that Christian vote that are more fragile. So you, you see the, the agony in Mitt Romney's eyes, and he, he represents the Mormon vote, which in the end strongly went for Trump. Uh, but Trump represents everything that um, you know, good Christian values should be opposed to. And yet because, largely I think because of his position on the Supreme Court and abortion rights, he's been able to hold on to very strong support mm-hmm. from that evangelical mm-hmm. base. And if it were to, to crumble because of his, his personal immorality, uh, because a large religious denomination like the Mormons or the Southern Baptists decides they've had enough of him, uh, then that would pose a real danger to his re-election. So very briefly, is he is he going to win again? I think so, yes. I think it's likely. Yeah. I mean, until we know exactly who the Democrats choose. But I think it's tied to this point here. I think it's a bit like Roe 
fits into this divisiveness. And I think expanding the kind of intensity of the of the opposition between sides in this so-called culture war probably benefits Trump. And to bring it back to UK politics, that's part of what we see happening here is divisions taking forming within the country that aren't straightforwardly about economy and class, but are connected into this wider sense of kind of cultural division, decline and, oh. and so forth. And that, and that, I think, plays into the hands of certain kinds of um, negative politics. Although, to, to disagree with that somewhat, the divisions are being built here in Britain. But without that profound uh, divide that comes from religiosity, which plays a very different role in American politics than it does in British politics. You can still cultivate those divides, class resentments, regional resentments, and, 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 the, and cultural resentments. But the culture war in America is grounded in religion. And what's been absolutely remarkable about Trump is how an obviously irreligious person has nonetheless strategically maybe unintentionally, maybe he stumbled into this strategy essentially rather than thinking of it cleverly. Maybe allies of his within the religious right realize how this works. But as long as that support of the religious right holds, he, he's, he's going to be extremely difficult to beat. And I think, you know, well, we have 17 months. Uh, he would have to uh, be involved in, I think, a scandal of personal immorality so great that the religious right could no longer hold with him. And I actually, if, if, if evident, you know, so you think, what could it be that he hasn't already done? Isn't Having an uh, affair with a porn, porn star, star, not enough. I, no. think, I think it would have to be something, and I wouldn't be surprised if this exists. People are saying, as Trump himself likes to say, if there were evidence that he insisted that a mistress have an abortion, for example. That's the kind of thing that could come out between them. Right. Actually and shooting someone in fifth on fifth Actually avenue. shooting someone. <laughs> well, that's the thing. They consider it murder, right? Okay. So he would literally have to murder someone. All right. We'll have to wait. View. We'll have to wait and see. That's that's all for now. Thank you to Emma Long and Michael Fraser for coming in to talk to us. Uh, thanks also to the BBC Sky, Reuters, ITV and Channel 4 News for our news clips. We're taking a short break over the summer. We're back in the autumn with more podcasts. But that's all for now. Thank you for listening. <laughs> 